today's uh, discussion that uh, David Hoffman is going to be leading on how Medicare is about to score physicians, implications for reimbursement, ethics, and care. Uh, my name is Samir Lada. I'm the Associate Director, director of the Bioethics Program here. And uh, I'd like to introduce David. Um, David is a healthcare lawyer and clinical ethicist and the Chief Compliance Officer at the Floating Hospital. In his private practice, David has provided counsel to hospitals, medical centers, and individual practitioners in governance, mergers, affiliations, and medical litigation, bioethical decision-making, and regulatory matters. He has served on and advised hospital ethics committees and institutional review boards. David has written on a variety of healthcare subjects, including use of medical imaging technology in litigation, equal protection rights of physicians, and regulatory responses to the emerging physician shortage. Many of you, of course, know him, so I don't need to introduce him to you, um, as he also teaches our law and bioethics course here at Columbia, and will be teaching a new course on end-of-life ethics this fall. So David, please welcome. Thank you, Samir. <clears throat> Hello. Deep breath. This is going to be a very, very fast-paced review of something that most people in healthcare, uh, both on the practice side and the ethics side, don't even know about and really ought to. Now, for those of you who know me, um, uh, you know my feeling that any topic that's important ought to be able to be reduced to a single sentence. So in case you have to leave early today, here we go. In 2019, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services will hand out grades to virtually every physician practicing and accepting Medicare, resulting in up to a 9% increase or 9% decrease in the reimbursement that those doctors get for the same care that they're providing today, which will come as a huge surprise to most of them. That's it. What we're going to do now is walk through why all of that's happening and how that affects the ethical decisions that clinicians and institutions have to make as we move into this age of what we euphemistically refer to as healthcare reform. So let's get started. We should all start with a little dose of humility. Bacon said knowledge is power, that's certainly true, um, but the converse isn't what's important. Um, ignorance is not weakness, as Martin Luther King said, ignorance is dangerous, and this is especially true now, because the changes in reimbursement for Medicare, which we can certainly expect to spill over into all of the other reimbursement programs for healthcare, are being profoundly changed in ways that have not gotten enough attention, even though we, those of us in healthcare administration, have been talking about this since before 2016, and when this starts hitting people and institutions' pocketbooks, when reimbursement starts to change, um, there's going to be a lot of anger and a lot of fear, and my purpose tonight is to send a few more people out into the world who will be able to bring some rationality to the discussion that will ensue from the panic. So tonight we're going to talk about lots of acronyms. Healthcare is full of acronyms. HCAPS, CAPS, VBP, DISRIP. You'll find out about all of that. And now this new acronym, MACRA, which which isn't so new, but is new to most people. This is the list of acronyms. Whoop, back up. Nope. Well, it ought to scroll. 
But this is a list of four pages of acronyms. If anyone's interested in reading them, I have them right here. Um, that are the preface to the regulations that create this scoring system. And this, by the way, is only a small part of MACRA. And um, I didn't do this just as a visual display. When I read a complicated law like this, I need to have these lists of acronyms sitting next to my computer because I've been doing this for over 30 years and I can't follow all the acronyms. I, for example, thought I knew that CPR stood for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but no, it stands for customary, prevailing, and reasonable, which is a way of defining how much money a kind of treatment ought to get reimbursed for. So this is the law, oh, I'm sorry, this is the one that should scroll. Let's see if we can get this to scroll, because it's really kind of unbelievable. Nope. Nope. This was such a. Can you go back once and just try to answer? And now hit what? Yeah. Press uh, the next again and then just wait. There we go. Neat effect. Um, this is what you have to understand just to be able to read this one regulation that creates this system for grading, literally it's on a zero to 100 grade scale, um, all of the doctors who provide care to Medicare patients. Uh, and, and so that will make the point that we're dealing with that level of complexity in the way this law has been drafted to accomplish what? to basically pit clinicians against clinicians, right? Because as we will discuss shortly, um, there are going to be winners and losers under MACRA. And um, the people who are the losers are going to find it very hard to practice medicine the way they've been practicing after this law kicks in between 2019 and 2022. So context, right? We're talking about the regulation of reimbursement for healthcare, something that's been going on for a long time. Um, and under the old system, simply fee-for-service medicine, which kind of means what it sounds like. There won't be much of that business about things meaning what they sound like after this. Um, the rules of healthcare compliance were pretty simple, right? Don't bill for care you didn't provide. That's stealing. Pretty simple, straightforward. Second rule, don't bill for care that you provided that wasn't medically necessary. That's also stealing. Maybe a little more complicated because somebody's got to decide what is and is not necessary. But if a patient comes to the emergency department with a stub toe and you do a chest x-ray, um, that chest x-ray probably wasn't medically necessary unless the person had uh, respiratory arrest while waiting in the emergency department, and that better be documented in your note. Third rule, much more complicated. Don't bill for care that was provided, that was medically necessary, but that was of poor quality. That's what? Quality has never meant the patient gets all better, because doctors were not expected to guarantee results in order to get paid. With MACRA, that's over. Because MACRA is payment for outcomes. And as MACRA rolls out, slowly, it's going to become more and more apparent to doctors that they are migrating from simply being providers of health care to being the guarantors of health and the guarantors of access to care. They're going to become the insurance companies. More on that. So we've always had lots of acronyms, more now. HCAPS, I mentioned earlier, is the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. That's why we call it HCAPS. And that is the Press Ganey or other commercial survey that you get in the mail after you've been to the doctor or been to the hospital. And it's a wonderful concept to survey patients about their experience. There's a problem. Only about 5 or 10% of patients send in the survey, 
and the ones who do are the ones who are angry about something. Now, they could be angry about the food, they could be angry about their care, they could be angry about not getting all better, they could be angry that they couldn't find a place to park. This is part of what doctors are getting graded on, the subjective assessment of the quality of care. CAPS is the same thing for non-hospital care, so that's ambulatory care, or any other kind of treatment that goes on other than on an inpatient basis. Same issue amplified, because many, many more providers, people who provide physical therapy, people who provide counseling, people who provide access to social services, they will be subject to this evaluation and that's going to affect the way they interact with doctors because everyone's very worried about keeping their scores up. Value-based purchasing, that's what's replacing fee-for-service medicine. Fee-for-service medicine, pretty clear what we're talking about. Value-based purchasing, not so clear. What it is, is paying for outcomes, either outcomes in terms of clinical quality or outcomes in terms of people either not getting sick or if they get sick, getting better. DISRIP, you may have heard about, is a program that the federal government utilizes now in uh, about eight or ten different states, Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. It's a mouthful, but it's kind of what it says. It's an incentive payment program. The federal government, for example, in New York, gave New York $8 billion in the form of what's called a waiver to reduce the number of unnecessary hospital admissions by 25%. That's part of health care reform. So the first question that should occur to all of you is, well, what's the definition of an unnecessary or avoidable hospital admission? And when you boil it all down, the definition is any hospital admission. Any hospital admission ought to be avoidable, so what the DISRA program is seeking to accomplish is to save that $8 billion and more by reducing the number of hospital admissions by 25%. And then, of course, there's MACRA. MACRA came on the scene in 2016, and most people still have no idea what it is. MACRA is the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, which, of course, begs the question, what's CHIP? CHIP is the Child Health Insurance Program. It's gotten a lot of press recently because Congress was holding CHIP hostage to get a tax cut bill passed and a bunch of other legislation. So that makes MACRA the Medicare Access and Child Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act of 2015. That's why we call it MACRA. So what exactly is MACRA? MACRA is this sweeping change in the way the federal government pays for Medicare services. Now, we all have a hard time keeping Medicare and Medicaid and TRICARE straight in our heads. Medicare is this program that pays for medical services and other kinds of services for the elderly and the disabled. Medicaid pays for care to people who, for the most part, can't afford their care. So you can divide Medicare and Medicaid that way, except that about two-thirds of Medicaid dollars go to pay for nursing home care. Those are people who got older than they thought they would and blew through all of their personal savings and exhausted their Medicare benefits and wound up in a nursing home being paid by Medicaid. So if people start talking to you about Medicaid is all this money that we're wasting on poor people, remind them, no, that's money that we're spending to take care of all of our mothers and fathers and lots of other people when they wind up broke because healthcare is so expensive in America and they're still in a nursing home, that's paid for. At least two-thirds of those dollars go to the nursing home. So Medicare 
access and Child Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act of 2015. How did those two things get lumped together? That's politics, right? Medicare, mostly old people. CHIP, mostly young people. Um, every piece of legislation has some compromise attached to it. That's why we have MACRA. And what MACRA did that got a lot of attention at the time, especially from doctors, they thought this was a big win, is it repealed the sustainable growth rate and set up a system for rewarding clinicians Pay attention to these words. Rewarding clinicians for value over volume. And then it streamlined lots of other programs and created something called APMs, which are actually AAPMs, but more on that later. So the sustainable growth rate, one of my favorite oxymorons in healthcare governance, the sustainable growth rate was actually the system put in place to cut the amount of money that doctors got paid for providing the same amount of care to the same number of patients. What was sustainable was the current level or a slightly reduced level of money spent on care. So it was not sustaining the growth, it was cutting the growth as the population, growth in dollars, as the population grew, so that doctors were taking care of more patients for less money. So doctors um, fought back, they complained. How do you expect us to take care of more patients for less money? And so every year, Congress would pass the doc fix bill to push forward another year the implementation of the sustainable growth rate until MACRA came around in 2015 and did away with it. And what MACRA replaced the sustainable growth rate with is MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, sort of like DISRUP, right? Folding together the Physician Quality Reporting Program, known as the PQRS, value-based modifiers, that's actual adjustment in the amount of money paid, and all kinds of incentives carrot and stick to get doctors and hospitals to adopt electronic medical record systems that would make care safer, make the exchange of in information between doctors more reliable, and give the government the data that it needed to implement the macro system of scoring doctors, which we'll get to in a few minutes, called the QPP, the Quality Payment Program. Following all these acronyms, this is why they put them at the beginning in the summary. So, MACRA. So this is an old slide. Today was 2016 when I first started talking about this. Uh, this is not my slide, I stole it from CMS. Actually, I didn't steal it because it's not copyrighted and it's paid for by tax dollars. But anyway, <laughs> the rules came out in 2016 to actually implement. That's why government information isn't copyrighted because we paid for it. Um, 2016, the rules came out and people started talking about this system of grading and rewarding and punishing doctors. Um, not normal people, people like me, people who are healthcare policy nerds. And we started thinking about whether this meaningful use, this incentive to switch to electronic medical records wasn't actually a Trojan horse. Because what MACRA does this year <coughs> is take all of this data that the government pulled in from the electronic medical record in 2017, that was the measurement year. And this year, it's being analyzed. And starting in January of 2019, doctors will start getting grades. Just like in grade school, it's going to be somewhere between a zero and a hundred. And you have to get more than a 15. Seems pretty easy, right? Um, to not be penalized the first year but that penalty line goes up and up and up 
in each successive year. So with that data, the doctors get assigned to one of two groups. The MIPS group, which we're going to talk about mostly tonight, and the APM group, Alternative Payment Model Advanced, so really it's AAPM, but you know, they're acronyms. Whew. This is the guts of MACRA. Oh, by the way, ethics, it's coming. MACRA in 2019 will result in up to a 4% cut or 4% increase in reimbursement to Medicare doctors based on their score. In 2020 it goes up to 5%, then 7%, and it tops out at 9%. That's up to a 9% increase in how much you get paid for providing the exact same care or a, up to a 9% cut. Now why do I say up to? because they can't tell us whether the best performing doctors are going to get a 9% cut or a 9% increase because they don't know. Why don't they know? Because MACRA, like the sustainable growth rate, is designed to be expense neutral for the government. That means all they're doing is moving the dollars from one pocket to another. There are no new dollars. In theory, they're not taking any dollars away, although they kind of are because the population is growing, especially the Medicare population. But every dollar that someone gets as a bonus has to be a dollar that somebody else is losing as a penalty. That's that expense neutral phenomenon. So they'll figure out what everyone's macro score is. And so a score of 82 can only result in a dollar in increase in reimbursement if enough doctors have a negative score, something below the cutoff line, and that's a moving target also, um, that they're giving up a dollar. So this is why there are winners and losers, and it's little discussed yet, but this is going to result in doctors being in direct competition with each other and like musical chairs some doctors are going to be forced out of the game. So MACRA looks at the quality and the cost and the process used in providing care, the efficiency in these four categories. Quality, that's both subjective and objective quality, so it's those HCAP scores, Prescani, the survey you get in the mail. It's also objective quality and that's done through core measures where doctors and hospitals are required under MIPS to report in data about how well their patients do. And then resource use, that's a euphemism for cost. So doctors are going to be rated based on how cost effective they are. Clinical practice improvement, that is, what are they doing if they're not scoring so well to improve their scores? And then, my favorite, advancing care information. That goes back to the electronic medical record and getting more patients involved in interacting with the healthcare delivery system electronically through email and text messages at one end of the spectrum and remote cardiac monitoring from home that's fed to your doctor over the internet at the other end of the spectrum, and of course someday robotic remote surgery. There's a little theoretical bonus of a quarter of a percentage point to increase the amount of money in the pool, but again that's offset by the growing population. So the quality payment program that's that scoring that we're talking about, um, will impact doctors in both the MIPS program and the AAPM program, but in different ways. Most doctors initially are going to be put into the MIPS program, because you only get into the APM program if you're doing some pretty advanced work in monitoring and managing 
both the cost and the quality and the technology involved in giving health care. We'll talk about more of that later, but the APM group are going to be the doctors who are involved in um, the, the ACO, the Accountable Care Organization movement, or patient-centered medical homes, all of those really highly advanced practices. When you see APM, think of doctors and medical groups as insurance companies, because that's really what they're going to become. They are going to be assuming financial risk for taking care of their patients. In one form or another, eventually they're going to wind up on something called a PPPM system. That's not in your acronym list. It's a new one. That stands for a per payment per month reimbursement for all of the care that your patient needs. So you're going to get, say, a dollar per patient per month, and 90% of your patients won't need any care. So you're going to get, if you have 100 patients, you're going to get $100 to take care of the 10 patients who do need care. And if you can take care of those 10 patients for $9.50, you have a 50, per, 50 cent profit. If it costs you $12, then you've lost $2 on that month. And obviously, add zeros to the ends of all these numbers. MIPS is for the doctors who are not yet in a practice setting where they are assuming financial risk. So MIPS rewards doctors for the things that they're doing to control their costs while they're still being paid essentially on a fee-for-service medicine basis. So they're still at base billing for each task that they perform, evaluation, treatment, test, imaging study. But the government will be collecting this data starting in 2017 and every year thereafter to evaluate in the MIPS program how the doctor is doing on all four of these criteria. Oops, wrong way. So this is what we think the scoring is going to look like in 2019 and 2020, the first two years when there are actually going to be adjustments. So if you don't participate at all in 2019, you're going to get a 4% or up to a 4% negative adjustment. That's polite speak for a cut in reimbursement. If you do sort of the bare minimum that CMS expects all doctors to do, you're going to get three points. So it's like getting a three on your report card. If you do some things that enable the government to evaluate your care, you'll get between four and 69 points. And if you do some things that actually represent quality, or performance to the government, you could get greater than a 70 point scale, and that's when you're first in line for the upper end of the range of a bonus, of an enhancement to payment. Next year, well, the next payment year, 2020, you have to get up to a 15 point score in order to avoid a negative adjustment. If you're between 15 and, 60 and 70, effectively, 69.99, you'll have some positive adjustment. And if you get above 70 again, you'll be in line for the maximum adjustment, which is, again, up to a 5 and then a 7 and then a 9% increase. So that's how the grading hits a doctor's practice. APMs, that doctor as insurance company system, will still use the same scoring, but it'll be applied in different ways because remember, those doctors aren't getting paid on a straight fee-for-service basis uh, anymore. So they'll get paid differently depending upon whether they're practicing in a qualified medical home model or a bundled payment system or some other risk-based we used to call it capitation, more on that later, but some basis upon which the doctor is getting paid other than just per click, per examination, per treatment, or per diagnostic test. That's the difference between APMs 
and the MIP system, not a lot of doctors are going to be affected by the APM system for at least another two or three years, and most of the doctors who are, are employed either by a hospital or a medical school or a large multi-specialty group practice. So the government's really worried that doctors have not been paying attention to this since 2016. So there's been lots of promotion in the medical literature and this is the CMS QPP website where a doctor can look up their, by their NPI number, the National Practitioner Identification Number, where they are and what they need to do to at least maintain the current level of income. So this is the current verbiage under the quality payment program for what we were talking about before and the weighting, very important. 50% of your QPP score comes from the quality measures. Remember that subjective and objective measures of quality. 25% comes from advancing care information, that's the whole computerization and electronic interaction with your patients. Starting out, 10% comes from how well you're doing on cost compared to your peers. And 15% is how hard you're trying to boost your score. So think of that as the, the most improved or best effort in Little League category. Everything in MACRA and in QPP, the scoring system, works on a measurement year and then the second year after that is the performance year or the payment year so that as this system moves forward and the rates of penalty and the rates of reward go up, your reward will always come the second year after the year that they measured your performance. And performance is forever and the records are forever. So every doctor's score, their, their grade, their QPP score, is going to be available on the internet forever. Public record. CMS is really concerned to get more doctors out of MIPS into APM so that the doctors have, and I really don't like this, game, this uh, expression from a clinical perspective, um, skin in the game. I guess it's a football thing. Um, they want doctors to have financial risk, to be using electronic means of recording all of their information because it's easier to pluck the data out of an electronic record than it is out of a paper record, and they want the doctors to be reporting lots of outcome data, quality reporting. All of that feeds into the ability of the government to evaluate who's doing a good job and who's doing just an old-fashioned normal job and reward the doctors and the groups that are doing an excellent job by taking money away from the doctors who are sort of just doing what they've always been doing. These are some examples of the kinds of programs that will qualify to get you out of MIPS into APM because it means that you're subjecting yourself as a clinician to some financial risk. So there's a demonstration project for end-stage renal disease, dialysis, transplant. There are bundled payment programs for different diseases. One of those, for example, is joint replacement. So the government says, let's try this. If somebody needs a total hip replacement, we'll pay you $100 for the evaluation, for the surgery, for the rehab, and for keeping the person mobile and keeping them from falling and breaking their hip again, that's a form of a bundled payment. ACOs, accountable care organizations, again, forcing groups of clinicians to work together to provide capitation at a community-wide level, and that's a form of risk sharing. Primary care and oncology are programs in development because there's a lot that needs to be done in wellness 
advancement and a lot that needs to be done with the cost of treating patients with cancer that CMS would like to force into this APM model. So the AMA is all over this, the American Medical Association. Why? Because this is going to dramatically and for many of its members negatively affect their ability to practice medicine. So they have been flooding all of their avenues of communication with all sorts of training and evaluation uh, technology all under the title of the AMA's Steps Forward program. So you can go to the Steps Forward website as a clinician, put in your NPI and get all sorts of customized advice for what you need to do to improve your practice. And so there are 50 odd modules. Um, these are just a few of my favorite. Um, forming a patient and family advisory council. That can't be bad. Listening with empathy, whatever that is. Preventing physician distress and suicide. What's that doing there? And then of course, quality reporting and the importance of qualified clinical data registries, QCDRs, in maximizing your success. But let's go back to that suicide one. Why would the American Medical Association be including information about preventing physician distress and suicide in a discussion about reform for reimbursement changes. Use your imagination on that one. So at the AMA website, you can click on learn about MACRA or you can take the MACRA assessment. Now I tried to find out how many doctors have actually taken the MACRA assessment and um, they won't tell us because they don't want us to know. So what does this have to do with ethics? You know, it's changing the way doctors get paid for care to get away from an incentive to do lots of care, to do lots of tests, to do lots of imaging studies. Maybe we've been providing more care than is absolutely necessary. You know, maybe that CAT scan doesn't reveal a brain tumor. Maybe it does. If the CAT scan only reveals a brain tumor in one in 10,000 people, is that an important CAT scan? Depends upon if you're the one in 10,000 people, right? So think about that. What MACRA and MIPS and APM and the QPP, the Quality Payment Program does, is it turns the notion of conflicts of interest on its head. That may be a good thing, may be a bad thing. We really don't know. Which begs the question, what is a conflict of interest in the context of MACRA and this notion of scoring or grading physicians? Well, it's pretty simple. It's an incentive to undertreat as a response to an incentive to overtreat, right? Under a fee-for-service medicine system, if a doctor is sitting there saying, you know, this patient's had a headache and it's localized and it seems to be interfering with the patient's hearing and there's a twitching in the person's eye, that could be a brain tumor or an aneurysm or an AVM. That's an arteriovenous malformation. That, that's not in the acronyms either. That's medicine, not reimbursement. But maybe I should do a CAT scan, or at least let's start with an MRI, right, because that's non-radiation. Um, and it might show nothing, right? In pregnancy, doctors do lots of sonograms just to make sure that the baby's okay. The vast majority of sonograms, thank goodness, are negative. Not negative bad, negative no findings. Language is funny in medicine. Under MACRA, all of a sudden, doctors are being paid to keep people well 
and are being rated on the basis of how happy they keep the patient, subjective quality, and how healthy they keep the patient, objective quality, and putting them in the role of financial guarantor of the patient's access to care. That's all that bundled payment stuff. And what that amounts to is the potential incentive to undertreat. To say, you know what, we don't need to take you in for surgery because surgery hurts and it's bloody and there's a long recuperation. Let's just monitor that mass that's growing in your abdomen and see how much more it grows. Or, you know, let's not do a radical prostatectomy for your prostate cancer. Let's just do some radiation treatment. It doesn't hurt as much. There's no recovery time. And it's a lot less expensive. So David Himmelstein wrote about the earlier incarnation of this cost containment, shifting responsibility, making doctors financially invested in the provision of health care. The last time we explored this whole issue, when it was simply called capitation in the mid-80s. This was the unintended consequence of Hillary Clinton's attempt to do health care reform when Bill Clinton was president. The reform didn't succeed, but what they did succeed in accomplishing is alerting the business community, ooh, there's a lot of money in this health care stuff. We should get a piece of that. So, as Himmelstein describes in that journal article that I just had up there, um, the companies, the commercial interests that moved into this saw an opportunity to incentivize the doctors to undertreat, to withhold care, and as a condition of the payment to tell them that they couldn't tell their patients that they went from having an incentive to overtreat under fee-for-service medicine to an incentive to undertreat under capitation, where they were getting paid a per patient per month fee, and the more money that was left over at the end of the month, the more money they made. So Himmelstein observed from George Orwell, let's hope that Orwell's memory hole remains in good repair because as in the book 1984, fans will recall that appliance incinerated reminders of things more conveniently forgotten. The interest in the 80s of managed care companies was to incentivize doctors to undertreat so that they'd have an extra dollar or two left at the end of the month, I'm making these numbers up, which would mean that the insurance company had hundreds of dollars left over at the end of the month. So here's the problem. Physicians were pressured to withhold care and hide the fact that they were withholding care from their patients. And they were paid bonuses. Himmelstein reports up to $150,000 annually offered to doctors who did more themselves and reduced the number of referrals to specialists. Now maybe that's a good thing, but not if the patient doesn't know why their doctor is not referring them out to a specialist for care. Our protests of those incentives and a contractual provision forbidding their disclosure, which were called gag clauses, led to delisting, forcing off the panels of award-winning physicians who often attract unprofitable sick patients. They were delisted. This is the scary one. Himmelstein quotes an academic leader who admonished the doctors in his or her department, we can no longer tolerate having complex and expensive to treat patients encouraged to transfer to our group. 
it's altogether common for patients who are being treated in community hospitals, when they have something really complicated wrong with them, they get referred to an academic medical center. It's kind of why we have academic medical centers. Well, that and training doctors. But this is an example of this incentive not just resulting in potential undertreatment, but it results in offloading. A lot of the same ethical problem that we understand occurred giving rise to EMTALA, the Anti-Patient Dumping Act that applies to emergency departments. So this was the EMTALA anti-dumping phenomenon spread over the entire healthcare delivery system. So what should we do differently this time? We know what went wrong. We know that in time and through lawsuits, the gag clauses were declared illegal. The opportunity for patients to know what incentives their patients were operating under, their physicians were operating under, was disclosed. Many doctors decided to organize into bigger groups so that they could compete and negotiate competitively with the insurance companies. And now what we see happening is literally insurance companies putting themselves out of business. And we're going to see this phenomenon as we see the MACRA, MIPS, quality payment program scoring phenomena play out simultaneously. We're going to see insurance companies saying to these now large, sophisticated medical practice groups, primary care groups, specialty groups, multi-specialty groups, which are sort of like hospitals without any hospital beds, faculty practice healthcare systems and ac academic medical centers, they're going to organize to negotiate with the insurance company over what that per patient per month fee ought to be. And as those contracts become more sophisticated, and as the medical groups start hiring the actuaries and the care managers and the accountants and the financial planners away from the insurance companies, and they assume more and more of the risk, they become the insurance company. Well, if they're the insurance company, what does the insurance company become? It becomes a clearinghouse. Uh, paper pushing organization. We have a name for them, they're called third party administrators. But all they're going to do is accept the insurance premiums from individuals or from employers, pay it out to the medical practice groups as a per patient per month fee. The medical practice groups assume all the risk. If they do it well, they'll make a profit. If they do it badly, they'll go out of business. And then somebody else will pick up that contract. What will happen is the employers, because most health insurance in America is paid for either by employer-based plans or government-based plans, and government is also in on this action, that's what managed care organizations are, they'll say to the insurance companies, which are now really just fancy third-party administrators, um, we don't need you. We can process our own claims because guess what? The computer does all that work anyway. So we can buy computers too, and we can collect premiums from the employers, and we can process the payments to the doctors. That can all happen automatically with electronic banking. Insurance companies go away. Now they're not going to go away without a fight. So this is going to be an enormously interesting transition. But while all of that financial battle is going on, there's going to be another battle going on within the healthcare delivery system. What we need to do in order to win that battle inside healthcare delivery system, the, the healthcare delivery system is make sure that conflicts of interest are not treated as a dirty word, right? Part of what created the problem in the 80s with the capitation agreements and the gag clauses is doctors were embarrassed and fearful that somebody would find out that they went from having an incentive to overtreat to having an incentive to undertreat. So they were, to some extent, 
complicit in not wanting patients to understand how the way that they were paid was influencing the decisions that they were making about aggressive care or conservative care, observation versus intervention. That's what created the ethical dilemma that turned managed care on its head. Managed care is not an inherently evil business process. In fact, health maintenance organizations, which have been around since the 70s, have been both the provider and the insurer from the get-go. In fact, that is the definition of an integrated delivery system. Providers and payers all under one roof. The problem is when we don't express to our patients that this reality exists, right? So I'm a lawyer. People come to me with their problems. I don't wish their problems on them, but when they come to me, I need to be paid to help them solve their problems. Is that a conflict of interest? Yeah. I want to be paid. They don't want to pay for a lawyer. That's a conflict in interest. It's a difference in interests. It's not a bad thing. And frankly, it's not anything that we can make go away because everyone needs to be paid for their services somehow. So what we've been talking about for the last about an hour is the transition from one set of, in, set of incentives to another set of incentives. Neither one of them is bad, they just are. So how do we do this? How do we destigmatize conflicts of interest? The answer is we have to embrace them. We have to talk about them as matter-of-factly as we talk about gravity and as we talk about risks of procedures and the negative outcomes that sometimes come from providing health care. This needs to be a discussion that is so matter-of-fact that nobody thinks it's anything to whisper about. So we have to not be ashamed of them. We have to talk about them openly within the practice environment and with patients. Patients need to know that either because of what their employer decided or what the government decided, their doctor is being paid on some sort of a value-based purchasing basis, some version of a per patient per month payment, and that the doctor is being scored on how well they do. We have to manage these conflicts of interest. We need to acknowledge that there are incentives built into the system that should not be allowed. One of the incentives is cherry picking patient populations, right? If you're being paid a per patient per month fee and you have 100 patients assigned to you and you're getting a dollar a piece, you're collecting $100 a month. That's it. If none of your patients need any care that month, you've got $100 in your pocket. If all of your patients need care that month, you may be broke. If just a few of your patients, let's say five out of 100, 5%, are costing you $95 a month, you'll be much better off if you push those five patients over to somebody else, like maybe a nice academic medical center. Now you have your 95 patients, five more that replace those. You're still getting $100. You've got a much better chance of coming out with money in your pocket at the end of the month. We need to talk about that. And we need to track and report movement of patients. Because if we're reporting on the internet, doctors' scores for cost, quality, improvement activities, and use of technology, then we sure ought to be reporting who's got patients that they don't want, that they want somebody else to be burdened with. So we have to monitor all of this within groups, within communities, academically, and at the government level, because if clinicians and practice groups are allowed to shun expensive patients, we know where they're going to wind up, 
right? They're going to wind up at our safety net institutions. They're going to wind up in the emergency department even though that's the most effective, least, most expensive, least effective way of providing care. And if that is allowed to happen, that will be as bad or worse than the gag clauses that were the horror of the 80s. So what is this challenge? How should we think about it? It's changing a flat tire on a bus while the bus is moving. That's what we're talking about here. What's so interesting about healthcare, other than the mystery and the immediacy of treatment decisions, is that you can never turn it off to fix it. There's no summer vacation. There are no holidays. There's no downtime. You don't even have at night to retool the way they do in factories. So we're changing a flat tire on a bus while the bus is moving. The first thing you need to do is throw out everything you ever knew about changing a flat tire on a bus on the side of the road. Because that knowledge is just going to distract you. We need to have a whole new way of thinking about maintaining the system, tweaking the system, evaluating the system while it keeps plodding on. Because there are no periods of time when there are no sick people. This is my favorite quote from Ben Franklin. We'll end on this. A sailor between two lawyers is like a fish between two cats. So substitute doctor for sailor. What we have today is a situation where clinicians, doctors, nurses, technicians, therapists, are in an environment, this legal environment, MACRA, MIPS, all the acronyms, that doctors are not in any position to deal with because it's not their environment. Right? The world of legal regulation is not the world of treatment. And that's why first we need to recognize that the challenges that face the healthcare delivery system, the ethical challenges that we face, are fundamentally challenges that have been imposed on us as healthcare providers from outside. A circumstance we have very little control over, but at the same time, something that is our responsibility while our natural environment is in the water, in the hospital or in the clinic, um, and that's what we have to be prepared for or it's not going to be a fair fight. Thank you. I know I ran over. I apologize. Normally we would just pick this up next week, but there is no next week. Uh, questions? Samir has some questions from online. I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Oh, good. Um, we and, did get uh, a late start, right? As you know, we're also um, holding this session over an interactive live stream, and so we have uh, a few people online and uh, a question from Charles, who's online. And he's asking, could you clarify what is APM in contrast to MIPS, and how do doctors move forward? I'm going to move, sorry, move from MIPS to APM. So they're going to move from MIPS to APM by assuming more financial risk, moving from the fee-for-service system where they're paid for improving how they operate under the fee-for-service system to the capitation system, to the financial risk-based system where the physicians and the physician groups step into the role of the insurance company. And so for starters, very, very few physicians are going to be in the APM model and you know what? Most of them probably don't want to ever wind up there because they're not in a position to act like an insurance company. But over time, the incentives are going to force them in that direction. <sighs> there. Yeah, um, I have a uh, question mm -hmm. that has to do with just. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, right, microphone because of the people in virtual yep. reality. Oh, there's a, hello? All right. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, so I have a question that has to deal with um, sort of consolidation because another thing that I think 
um, not only the transition to MIPS, but the transition for most physicians from MIPS eventually to APMs is going to trigger is a lot of like physicians who own smaller practices finding the need to join a larger practice or join a larger group of practices so that they're no longer being penalized for not being able to do as much as, say, Mount Sinai or Montefiore or some major hospital system, right? And so th that's not going to affect as many rural hospitals because there are some, I mean, there's some control around that. But say, take a city like New, like New York City where you've got all of these smaller primary care practices, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to them? Are they going to end up disappearing? And how does that affect patients who are going to see a reduction in their choices for what, who they get to go to for right. care? So they're going to get pushed into, not physically pushed, but financially incentivized to move into a variety of different models of care, all of which sort of uh, uh, are represented in the accountable care organization concept. And that's the notion that Clinicians either who join in one legal entity or stay in their own independent practices but agree to share responsibility for a patient population, covered lives, and share a cut of that per patient per month fee, that's how they're going to make a living. Now the transition that you mentioned is really, really important because guess what? The QPP score, your grade under MACRA, follows you wherever you go to work. So if you happen to be one of those doctors who wound up with a 9% cut in reimbursement, it means if you go from private practice to a group practice setting, you bring your reduced reimbursement for doing the same work with you. It's going to make it really hard to find a job. That's why physician distress and preventing suicide is part of the AMA's program for adapting to MACRA. Yep. You only get yes, scored once, or do you get scored every three years? Or you you get three scored years? every year, okay. and that affects your reimbursement the second year after that. So there's room for improvement, but lots of doctors aren't going to be able to adapt to the changes in practice expectations that will get you that higher score. A quick example. So there are incentives for getting your patients to uh, interact with you electronically, email, text, whatever. I have a doctor friend who takes care of a largely aging population, recent immigrants, don't speak English, let alone use cell phones or text messages or computers, he's never going to be able to meet that standard. It's just not going to happen. Now, there are some features of the macro program that account for small practices and rural practices, but these sorts of penalties for doctors who are not practicing the kind of medicine that is being rewarded, they're going to have a hard time. And we are going to see, in addition to physician distress, and hopefully not too much suicide, we're going to see doctors just get out of the practice of medicine early. That's another problem, because we've known since 2008 that the rate at which baby boom generation doctors retire accelerates just as the non-doctor baby boom population is also aging and getting sicker and needs more medical care. So we have more patients, less doctors. That's a problem. So, oh, microphone. Just wait a sec. No, I was wondering how it will work like in terms of legal protection for the patient. Like for instance, like let's say that uh, like a physician uh, did under treat a patient and like uh, because he, you know, he made a wrong calculation, uh, could we use like this, this system of scoring like in court for instance uh, or could a physician say, well, I, I, I got some incentive to undertreat my patient. How is it going to work basically to, to so protect the, the patient? Here's the challenge. In an ideal world, that one that we don't live in, um, there'd be a strong consumer advocacy voice in this process that would demand that patient transfer, that dumping phenomenon, be part of the scoring system. But we don't have a powerful advocacy voice for patients, 
and it's not in the interest of the larger, better organized practice groups to draw a lot of attention to whatever they might be doing to encourage the sicker patients to go elsewhere. And that's part of our ethical dilemma, is that we don't have a market-based mechanism for bringing that very important consideration into the discussion. So that's one of our challenges. Val, microphone. So uh, in terms of caring for complex patients, you kind of know that it costs a lot mm -hmm. and it's not done very well because uh, a major issue is fractionation of care. Mm -hmm. So with this uh, neutral cost thing where some physicians are inevitably penalized in order to reward others, what is that going to do to this fractionation? Is it going to make it worse? Or yes, is it gonna it's going to yeah. make it dramatically worse. Again, in this transition period, and this goes back to the, the flat tire on the bus, if we were able to sort of just stop for a moment and look at what are the impacts of managing more complex patients, and risk adjustment is part of the formula, we just have no way of knowing if the risk adjustment mechanism in the algorithm is the appropriate balance because we haven't done this yet. So it's the transition that's going to be the tricky part. Arthur, uh, microphone. Sorry. This is from 2015, so President Obama was still the president. Um, my thought was that uh, their idea was get a lot of data and see what seems to work for a better uh, cost and then try to guide physicians to do that who cooked this up? Because this seems like, well, you're, here's some money and uh, you figure it out. Uh, you figure out how to get good health, uh, you know, within this, the bounds of this money. We don't really, uh, doctors are not, uh, even large practices, they don't have the, they have anecdotes, but they don't have the big data that might help them to say, well, you know, this is really kind of a waste. There's no real evidence that this works, but this other stuff actually does work. Why, what happened to the idea that there would be a larger, you know, scale of information, and that will right. provide good recommendations to the doctors. So most of that attention was focused on the commercial insurance market, and most of what we heard about in the public discussion of Obamacare had to do with either subsidies or requirements for working people to buy health insurance, People who couldn't afford to buy it at commercial rates would get the subsidies. And then there was always the Medicaid population. And that's why a big part of Obamacare was expansion of Medicaid, something that, for example, is just now happening in Virginia. Medicare being an entirely government-funded program, or federal government-funded program, and an entitlement, entitlement in the positive sense, not the uh, pejorative sense. Entitlement meaning everyone paid for it already, right? You pay for Medicare when you're young so that it's there when you're old. It's the basic philosophy behind insurance. So Medicare needed a much bigger solution and the government had all of the levers of power because it was all the federal government's money. And it is very interesting to me that as there was so much argument about repealing Obamacare and the focus on the individual mandate and the subsidies and all of that, this got no discussion at all. This is completely off the radar of the public discussion of health care reform. Uh, that's going to change. January 1st, 2019, when these scores come out and all of a sudden doctors become very, very concerned that they're going to wind up in the group that's having their reimbursement cut. And, and it's when people are under existential threat that you have to be most concerned about ensuring that they're adhering to ethical standards, because that's where the problem comes in. Any more? Nope. Any more we questions have online? No, we have okay. a minute or so. More questions? No, good. So let this soak in. This is only the beginning of this discussion. I raced through that so that you would have some idea of what is the context of what you're going to be hearing about after January. 
and then we need to start talking about this a whole lot more. Thank you.